Welcome back to the Hard But Worth It podcast, where we explore the leader's journey. I'm Mitch. And I'm Kirk. And today we are going to ask the question, why do boomers still think that millennials are entitled? And why are we still talking about this? I think that's a fabulous question. Why are we still talking about this? <laughs> and why know. did my grandpa have to walk uphill both ways in the snow to get to school when I had to ride the when I got to ride the bus? Yeah. Why? Ah, where does because this come you, from? Because you were so entitled. <laughs> I probably was. <laughs> Tell us real quick, like you're coaching uh, elder millennials mm -hmm. more and more mm -hmm. today than you than you ever were. They're kind of growing up in the ranks. They are now not just occupying the workforce; they are leading in the workforce. Yeah, they are. And this is still a point that comes up. And explain to me why are we still talking about this, and what is meant by this word entitled? Because I think. I think we want to kind of dispel that a little bit today and maybe hopefully put it for rest mm -hmm. once and for all because mm -hmm. we, we have that kind of authority here. <laughs> we do. <laughs> we, we are that powerful right. with our dozens of <laughs> listeners. <laughs> um, I think there's a shift happening. We talk about elder millennials. So first of all, what do we mean by that? And these are, if we, if we go with the generational breakdown, these are people that were, that are 37 to 43 right now. And they are, they are absolutely coming into their own. They are leading in, in new ways. They're running companies, they're in executive positions. They're finding themselves in the seat of power. And um, there's this old notion that, that, oh, that, that they heard when they were young, 24, 25 years old, about being entitled. And this story has just kind of stayed with us. Um, interestingly, one of the places I hear it more often now is not from the elder millennial, but it's from the boomers still. They're still going, and this is the way I hear it. Nobody wants to work. That's the version <laughs> of it. Today. Nobody yeah. wants to work. Um, they all want to, they, they don't know what they're doing, but nobody wants to work. And I'm, and I'm personally kind of tired yeah. of this conversation. Um, if no one was wanting to work, wouldn't our unemployment rate be a lot higher than it is? <laughs> it like, would seem so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I, one of the ways I, one of the ways I think about this is wh why, well, we're asking the question, why, why are boomers, why did they even start doing this? Why did this whole notion emerge that boomers somehow felt like they had the power and the authority and the responsibility to label an entire generation entitled? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think there's a few reasons why that happened that we'll explore, but I'd like to right off the bat say, yeah. I don't think that's the proper way to treat a generation to speak of the whole generation in one way is right. just a fundamental mistake. But then they did it when the, when the millennials were just coming into the workforce and I think they were frustrated and they were, there was something going on they didn't understand and they just called it entitled. But when I look back at that era, I was working with, with people, I still do, in their 20s, and I don't see them as being entitled. And sorry if you're in your 20s, this is going to hurt a little bit. <laughs> They're immature. Yeah. It's just immaturity. And, and I would, I, I think everybody, every generation in their 20s was immature. When I think back to the, what were the boomers doing? I don't mean all of them, but what's the sort of stereotypical? Yeah, if you're gonna you paint, know, if you're gonna paint a stroke, stroke on, on something, somebody, what were they doing in their twenties? Yeah. Well, at least on the West Coast, they were hanging out in the Panhandle of San Francisco, being hippies and doing yeah. all kinds of crazy oh, yeah. stuff and not working and yeah. and they weren't following the rules and they were trying to reinvent society and mm -hmm. the boomers did the exact same thing. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, all of them everywhere all the time. But what, what do you think what, Woodstock was? What were Ben and Jerry's doing <laughs> exactly. before exactly. Ben and Jerry's? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Hanging out at Woodstock, That's probably, right. and a bunch of entitled kids. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just immaturity. It's optimism. It's youthful vigor, and, and and that feeling of invincibility that they can go out and get whatever they want. And it's just part of being young. And I would imagine every generation has done that. And I would also imagine that the older generations have this amnesia, <laughs> right? And they start telling stories about how hard they worked and how hard it was yeah. on them and how much they had to pay their dues and go through this and that. And then they look at this new generation that's, that's doing things differently and they just go a bunch of lazy fill in the blanks. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think this whole notion right off the bat that the millennial generation is a generation is entitled is just wrong. Yeah. Mm, wrong's the wrong word. It's the wrong lens through which to look at it. Um, so, but, but why did it happen? Why does this continually happen? And it seems to me that 
this whole notion of these generational differences, right? We have the builders, the boomers, Gen X, Gen millennials, Gen Y, Gen Z, whatever's coming. Like we're starting to parse this thing all up. And it's likely because there has been during this period of time, rapid societal and technological changes. There are meaningful differences in your experience if you were raised in the 70s or the 90s or the 2010s. There, you were touching different things, yeah. experience, and they're meaningful. They're not. I don't want to overlook them. But we've c gotten used to pulling all this apart, and that those changes are causing us to feel a sense of an insecurity about where are we going, what's happening. And then when we look at the, the group coming up behind us, they are doing things differently, and we don't always like it, and we mm -hmm. don't understand it. And so we have this tendency to sort of wipe them with these big brushes. Right. And I think it's a lot of fear. I don't know what's going on. I don't like what's going on. And I wish they would do something that I understood. Yeah. Well, and don't you think, too, like going back to the example of grandpa or your dad, which was, you know, when I went to school, I walked to school barefoot in the snow uphill both ways. Yeah. And yeah. somehow as a child, we never thought about how that didn't really work Actually, out. We look yeah. back now, we're like, wow, that's pretty hard. <laughs> but but really, isn't it that they're just maybe saying in that that you're hard doesn't look, I don't think your heart is as hard as my heart. Mm -hmm. And when, when in all fairness, it's just different. It's different. The heart is different. I think know? sometimes because your heart doesn't look like my heart, I don't even recognize your heart as hard. Sure. I don't even, I see all the ways in which you're advantaged or privileged or yeah. have things I never had. And, you know, the example being my dad and my grandfather probably did have to walk to school and I got to ride the bus. And then now my kids got to ride with with me or their mom. Right. Yeah. We drove them to school and then and then we drove them to separate schools because they got to pick their schools and all that kind of stuff. So there is a way in which I think it's I don't even recognize that you have anything hard going on. I'm like, what are you complaining about? <laughs> Entitled little kid. You have everything. Yeah, you, right. you, you have everything I always wanted. Right. And yet. Isn't that what we really want deep down when our children are born? Like th going back to the very beginning of we're holding our firstborn mm -hmm. and there we are in their room. And all we want to do is create an environment where their life can thrive, where they can flourish. And we want to give them all the essential access to, to their needs and being nurtured so that they can grow up, uh, you know, going further, faster, stronger, longer than we might go. So there is this sense of by design and desire, we create an environment for them to thrive in that way. But then at some point we look at that and we go, you're entitled. <laughs> and yet we, we actually created the environment for them to become mm -hmm. somewhat privileged. And, and, and I have an issue with the word entitled actually anyway, because I think there's a, there's a good sense that we want our children to feel entitled. Mm -hmm. I, I would push for that. I would say that in a healthy environment, as I'm raising my littles to become, you know, adults who contribute to the world, that there's, there's a level of entitlement. I want them to feel they have access mm -hmm. to everything that belongs to me is available to them. Mm -hmm. And then if I can steward that environment right, they, they live with the sense of I deserve I have access to everything my dad. I didn't earn it, mm -hmm. but it's because of my status. Mm -hmm. It's because of my position and my relationship that I actually do have an entitlement here. Right. And, and as a result, I think what we want as parents too is, is to have that coupled with what we would say is responsibility. Right. And so there's a form of entitlement that starts to manifest itself into the world when it's not attached to responsibility, where I would say we all agree that isn't helpful, right? That doesn't show up in the world. Good. But again, that's, I would say a product of poor parenting, right? Don't blame the child. Don't blame the person who's following you. It might actually be systemic from the leadership model, which is I gave privilege mm -hmm. without responsibility. And now I'm resenting the fact that you feel entitled because you're not carrying responsibility. Well, who do we look to for that? Right, right. I think I think what you just described there was two different. This is trouble with the English language. Words words are tricky, yes. right? You just use the word entitled to describe something that was very positive when coupled with responsibility. Right. But when when divorced from responsibility, what we get is is um, well immaturity. Yeah. 
right? And we, and, and then I think what you're pointing to is that the boomers were the parents of the millennials and they entitled them. They gave them access. Yeah. They pulled them. They, they, they're the, they did the bubble wrapping and the helicopter parenting and raised these kids. And then we're a little upset with the results. Yeah. You're and critiquing your prod prodigy prodigy. <laughs> prod what is it? You're critiquing your own work product. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, I know it's not your kids. It's all the other kids that are it, the problem, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. But, 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 yeah. but then even going back to what you said at the beginning, this then becomes generationally, you know, like, like a, a pattern that we see. It's not the boomers and millennials. No. It goes all the way back yeah. to time and will continue to move forward because essentially we would say, too, that, that millennials who are growing up and maturing – at some point will become the boomer uh -huh. to the Gen Z's. Because uh -huh. they're, they're gonna, careful. if they're not careful, the temptation is to look at them and go, well, your heart's not as hard as my heart. Yep. And look at how easy you have it. Why are you so entitled? Right, right. There's, um, there's, a, there's a thing right in the middle of this, this word title, which is what I think you're getting to this. You want your kids to feel entitled to all that you have. You, mm -hmm. um, and, Right in the middle of that is this word title. So I was thinking as we were prepping and thinking this one through, I was like, right, I don't want to walk to work. And everybody used to have to walk to work. But I have title to a car now. I hold title to a mm -hmm. car now, and I want to use it. I want to drive it. But that's an enormous privilege. That's an amazing thing that allows me to navigate. Well, it does all the things we know. The yeah. way we navigate the world is incredible relative to people who used to always have to walk or possibly ride a horse. The distances I can travel. I'll drive hours to just go do something fun. That used to be a yeah. week journey, right? I feel entitled to that. Well, there's a way in which I am because I hold title to a car. And when we can... When we can couple that with responsibility, we actually want to live into our entitlement right. well. But I think you're absolutely right about getting those two words connected. Mm -hmm. When when you hold title to something, you're also responsible for it and its outcomes. Mm -hmm. And and so if I get in a wreck, if I don't treat my car well, if I there are all kinds of things about my car that can go really really wrong, but I also have to maintain it and fix it. And there, there's a burden there's a burden that comes yeah. with this kind of freedom, right? And those things are always connected. I'm frustrated with this conversation yeah i'm frustrated that we keep having it generationally over and over and i'm frustrated that the boomers did this to the millennials mm -hmm. and the millennials actually had to deal with that critique and they still had to go do the work instead of the boomers helping them do the work yeah. that they already had done because their parents were really frustrated when they were hanging out in their 20s smoking pot and going to totally. woodstock and yeah. all the things They've been through this before. Mm -hmm. So then we get to where we are now. And this phrase emerges just a few years ago. And it's the OK Boomer thing. Yeah. Um, I've had millennials say that to me. And I'm like, oh, no. Yeah. I am not a boomer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this OK Boomer. And what's fascinating to me right now is that the millennials are gaining sufficient power and strength in our society and ecosystem that they can actually just dismiss the boomers mm -hmm. now. And 20 years ago, the boomers were sort of riding roughshod over them in j j broad strokes. Right. Right. And so they finally turned the table. OK, boomer, you're irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I don't need to listen to you. And the tragedy of that, the thing that frustrates me is that the boomers are now in the season of their life where they have access to the kind of wisdom that can only come with age. Doesn't mean they've all accessed it, but they can. Right. And the millennials need that. And so when, and, and this, this fracture has happened and they can't, they're not talking to each other effectively mm -hmm. right now. And that's, that's the societal tragedy. Yeah. And, and unfortunately I would agree with you. Yeah. The millennials, um, aren't receiving it, but I would say they want it. They do. The disconnect is there, but I, I've never, I haven't found many millennials who are opposed that's right. to wanting to be mentored that's right. or fathered or, or run alongside with, with someone who has the wisdom to offer, yep. but there's a, there's a mutual dignity. And I wonder like this, this, if you look up the definition of entitled, it's, it's this sense that someone believes they deserve special treatment or special privilege, mm -hmm. um, as a result of, of just maybe being alive. Like mm -hmm. I deserve. And, and so I wonder if we flipped it to go, man, I, if, 
if the boomer generation, or let's call it the elder generation, the right. father generation, because it's just going to follow itself down. Yeah. <laughs> if, if or when, because it is a win thing, it's not all boomers. Mm -hmm. But when that generation is able to show up and rather than look to say, what, what are you taking? Why do you demand special treatment? And instead go, I'm going to look out to those I love and lead as you actually deserve special right. treatment. Right. Like, like when I step into my house, I believe my kids deserve mm -hmm. everything in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I know the reality is they can't be anything they want. And I, and I know there is a process of timing and, and, and responsibility that as they grow and demonstrate stewardship and responsibility, then more access is given so that that's good parenting yep. but at the end of the day i look out and i go man you are worth special privilege and if i can if i can push that out into my my work environment and those that i lead i mean i wonder what type of culture you would create because i don't know that they that they want privilege without responsibility but sometimes we withhold it right. and we say now we, we expect this of you, but we're not willing to give you the responsibility. So all we could do is critique and criticize mm -hmm. for the thing we're actually withholding because we, we can't get that from them if we don't give them the opportunity mm -hmm. to be responsible in the first place. They have to, they, when you put the weight, of the, the weight on them, this, this responsibility comes, I think, as pressure, yeah. as weight, as right. That's the thing that they rise up to and, and it strengthens them. And if we've been doing that the whole time, they consistently are growing into it. It's when they enter into their adult life and it's just, it's never happened. Everything's always been given to them. It's just, we're trying to protect them from any weight and pressure and right. threat and risk and, and harm. We actually prevent them from growing into the strength that they can carry later in life. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a weird way to think about it, but we're talking about parenting so much that <laughs> I think I, that the process of having children is all about kicking them out. And it starts at birth. When a, when a child is in utero, in a mother's womb, they are the safest they'll ever be. They're being breathed for. They're being fed. They're in this warm oceanic environment where they are <laughs> one with their creator. Right? Yeah. And then suddenly, no choice of their own, they experience pain and blood and cold, and they come out. They've been kicked out. And it's gotten more dangerous. Now, they're immediately returned back to a state of protection, right? And they are. And mom, in most cases, will breastfeed them or somehow yeah. feed them. There's, there's blankets. There's, they're immediately taken care of. But it's only because they got kicked out. And then over time, they get weaned, another kicking out. They have to learn how to self-regulate their own emotions. Yeah. They get pushed away from constant care. They have to learn how to feed themselves, put food in the hole. Like that's a whole journey. They then learn how to, how to walk. And walking is basically just a series of falling down to start with. And it's dangerous. And, and on and on and on this process goes, right? You get them on a bike, yeah. you're introducing more danger. Yeah. You get them in a car, more danger. We're constantly moving them further and further away from us, putting more and more pressure and responsibility on them. And at every move, we kick them out and then provide yeah. age-appropriate protection. But many of us think our job is to protect our kids. And that's true, but only after we kick them out and push <laughs> them away. And then, right? So this yeah. process continues on until finally one day they move out of the house. And hopefully you've gradually kicked them out over time to the point where they can handle the pressure of the world. Yeah. We're not just giving them access to our resources. We're not just protecting them. The lead point is the moving them further away mm -hmm. and bearing the, having them bear more responsibility and then protecting them in age appropriate right. ways. I think we miss that and we get that flipped around and we just think it's our job to protect our kids. Of course, it's our job to protect our kids. Right. Yeah. After we initiate the damage or after we initiate the probability, the increased probability of damage in their life. Yeah. And part of what's happening in that process, if we're parenting well, or, you know, we're, we're guiding that, that child or that young person well, is they're, they're becoming less focused on a me centric right. world. And they're be, they're becoming more aware of, if this is a, we world, right. This is a community. And I mean, we learned that early on, you know, how to, how to differentiate the cry of a want 
from the cry of need. And there are times we allow the baby to cry it out mm -hmm. in the room because it's, it's not a need and they're going to be okay. In fact, they need to learn that they can cry and I don't have to come coddle them every moment because mm -hmm. eventually they survive it and they, they grow more aware in the world. Right. So as we're doing that work, I believe what we're also doing, I, I want to I reclaim this word entitled. I hear it. Because I do. don't think it's all that bad. No, it's like it's, I have title to at something. At the end of the day, what I want in mm -hmm. those that I lead, I want them to feel the confidence to say, I know Mitch believes in me mm -hmm. and he's given me all the resources. He trusts me. He's guided me. And he's giving me the responsibility that goes along with it to where I can do anything now. But I think those people who feel entitled and carry the same weight of responsibility, mm -hmm. I think those are the ones who change the world. They make Agreed. the biggest impact on the world. Yep. Yep. I agree. And I like as you as you talk your way through this and you work to recapture the word, I think that's fascinating because yeah. I hadn't had that thought. I was like, this word has gotten in the way. I wanted to like, Yeah, get rid of it. Right. Yeah. But it's actually a powerful thing to so no, I I am entitled to be at this table. Yeah. I belong here. I know I belong here. As long as I'm willing to carry the responsibility That's of right. being at this table. That's exactly right. right. That's right. Yeah. So you at one of the one of the central things I want to accomplish in this conversation, one of them I already said is to is to flip this narrative. I don't think the millennials were entitled. Mm -hmm. I think they were just immature at that time. I think the boomers were scared. I think that it just created this this unnecessary label and pressure. What I've watched the millennials do in my coaching career over the last 15 years is I've watched them increasingly take responsibility. Yeah. I've watched them figure out that the world is hard and they do have to show up and do the work. I have watched them over and over have moments of like, holy crap, entrepreneurship is really difficult. Yeah. You don't just show up and make a ton of money. Okay, recalculate, I'm in. Or some of them say, recalculate, I'm out. And they go on to other things that are really important to them and hard as well. Right. Um, and now we have this cohort that is into this. They're in their, they're hitting 40. They're a little past 40. They're right around there. And they really are taking on the world. And I don't think, I think they're mature. I think they're capable. I think they're strong. I think they're amazing, just like most generations who came before mm -hmm. them. And I would like to erase this notion of negative entitlement because I think they did take responsibility for the world. Yeah. I do think they were doing something different. And I do think it was a bit confusing to them and everybody else in the midst of it. But I think largely it's going well. Yeah. And I want them to know that. Yeah. And it's a different type of hard is what is, is happening as the world changes. It's holding space to go, man, I don't I don't understand because truly we live in a time where our experiences are unique to our generation. Mm -hmm. But but that doesn't mean we dismiss the generation after us who's changing and maybe, you know, pioneering new paths that require new hard. Yeah. We have to be careful to not judge that. I hear a judgment that I don't know is is tied to entitlement. And it's certainly not tied to this generation doesn't want to work. Mm -hmm. Like whenever I hear that, I just want to like smack the person who says it because I, I actually feel like it's their way of copying out. It's a cheap comment. It is. That really has no bearing on the context of what they're saying. Yeah. But that being said, there, there is this, there is this reality though, that this next generation, while their hard is real and it's different, is creating some real voids. Like we talked about the, right. the, the tradesman type jobs. We're not getting replacement. We're not, so what we hear is, so what we'll hear though from a boomer is, man, I drive my truck by and I, I've got all these great shovel jobs and pickaxe jobs and all these, no one wants to work anymore. It's like, no, actually they are working. They're working hard. They're actually working hard and probably making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. They're just doing a different hard. So how do we, how do we still though answer that and address that? Because it clearly is a generational need. Yeah. Right. Well, there's two ways. One, I think that, that the market is going to take care of that. 
And I think the, tr the value of the trades with reduction of supply is going to go up and people are going to start going, wait a minute, I can yeah. go into this field and make a lot of money and yeah. do well and have his career. And I think yeah. that's And all I it. have to do is use a shovel. Right. I don't have to have a college degree. <laughs> I don't have to have all these others. I have these skills. I also think that there is a natural aptitude of people who do that kind of work really, really well. And at the moment, what we've done, and I think it's just natural, is we've turned our attention towards all these new emerging jobs and we've made them um, we, we've made the rock stars over there. The, the entrepreneur is our current you know, sort of special status star. Um, and, and so all kinds of people are now going, oh, in order to do well in life, we've been told the story, in order to do really well, my cohort believes that we have to do that kind of work, not that kind of work. But this is where Mike Rowe came along with dirty jobs. And he's elevating those. He's making those honorable again mm -hmm. in the way they always have been. Yeah. And I think there's a whole bunch of people who are well suited to build wonderful lives doing these, doing the trades. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just a matter of time until we get that sorted yeah. out. I do think in the middle of it, we're going to have a problem. And right now getting a contractor to show up at your house and do work is hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do think it's going to self-correct because we still need that done. I'm not particularly worried about that. No, problem I'm not either. In I the agree long with you. Term. In the short term, I think it's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I, I just think what I'm pointing out there is the fact that that's a real need doesn't necessarily mean it's a sign that our generation it doesn't want to work. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we have I, people who are making that conclusion. I had a, a client a number of years ago. He's actually not a boomer, so we, but but it's the the thought process I'm going to point to. He had. He has a, a, a job that doesn't pay really well. It's pretty mundane. It's not super interesting, um, but it does need to get done. Um, and he's having a really hard time hiring for it. Mm -hmm. and, he fi and he's having a really hard time hiring for it. And he's frustrated and he's grumpy and we're in a meeting and he says, the workforce in my town just sucks. And I looked at him, I says, maybe your job sucks. That's right. <laughs> so good. Because I had another client in the same town that was having no problem hiring. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, and he, and he looks over the desk at me and he goes, you're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> and so he started raising the wage yeah. and he started changing how the job was organized and, and he doesn't have that problem anymore. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I think we need more people challenging those thoughts. I mean, right. cause sometimes you just, they're thrown out into the universe and no one does anything with it. So we kind of accept it as true, but it's like, no. Actually, your job sucks. Yeah, nobody wants and to do that job. Let's just be real with that and then create a, you know, an invitation around that job that compensates properly for it. Yeah, and, uh, and I think there's all kinds of modifications like that. And there, there are experiments that are being run in real time. I think flex work hours and, and how we're doing the work from home, work in the office, and trying to navigate all of that are all big experiments to try to figure out how to get work organized again in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just going to let the experiments run and it's disruptive. And, yeah. but this notion that an entire generation just isn't up to par. I, I think they, yeah. And I think they've known that for a long time. Yeah. It's just, we're finally recognized, settle it, Let's bury it. Put a nail it. in that thing. Yeah. Put a because nail in it. Here's, yep. here's what I want the millennials to know is you guys are doing really important work. You're running really important experiments. You're working out how to be in the world and you're creating the world in which you want to be. And I think you guys speaking to them need, need to actually continue that, but do it with confidence and strength and power, wield that power because there are issues and problems that you're going to be able to address and solve that the older generations can't. Yeah. They, they don't know how, they don't know how to think about it that way. Um, that's why I want to, I think that's why we're excited about this idea is let's just, can we just rub this conversation away? Can yeah. we, can we make this be the last and it won't be, but increasingly we need to ignore the people who are saying those kinds of things. And as millennials, especially the elder millennials, they step into that power and wield it. Yeah. It's your time. Go for it. Yeah. And I think what we're wanting to really erase isn't this idea of entitlement or the conversation around empowerment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think what we're saying is we need to erase the idea that millennials are attached to that somehow uniquely. This is a generational thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a it's a human pattern that typically gets passed on from an elder to a younger generation. It's just what form does it take? What, what hairstyle are they in during that time? <laughs> yes, right? That's yes. really the, the reality of it is. Yeah. And at any point... If, if you're feeling as, as a younger 
generation person that you are entitled to something, then the question you need to ask yourself is, am I carrying the level of responsibility that is associated with that entitlement? And if you are, I think you have a good case to make to whoever your leader might be to say, hey, I deserve mm -hmm. this because. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're coming to the table feeling entitled, but you know you're not carrying the level of responsibility or desire to want to carry that responsibility, then you may be at a spot where you're, you're carrying the version of entitlement that we're talking about that is negative. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the version we want to empower. I love that. So to so, so, so me, there's just a little bit of work there that we do in our own personal development. So maybe we can end by saying, of course you're entitled and responsible. Yes. So go do the work. <laughs>